Um, our third speaker is Sarah Horowitz. Sarah is Associate Professor of History at Washington and Lee University. And she's the author of two recent articles on post-revolutionary French politics and culture, Policing and the Problem of Privacy in Restor Restoration Era France, 1815-1830, which appeared in French history, and The Bonds of Concord and the Guardians of Trust, Women, Emotion, and Political Life, 1815-1848, which appeared in French Historical Studies. Sarah's book, Friendship and Politics in Post-Revolutionary France was published by Pennsylvania State University Press in 2013, and her new project is on 19th century sex scandals. Today, Sarah is presenting a paper entitled, What's Love Got to Do With It? Familial Love, Hierarchy, and Politics in the choiseul Presley okay. Affair in 1847. opposite, which is murder. At 4.30 in the morning of August 18th, 1847, servants in the household of the Duke and Duchess de choiseul prelin awoke to the sounds of screams from the Duchess's chambers and frantic rings from her bell. They rushed into her bedroom, but found it uncharacteristically locked. Once they managed to break in, they found the Duchess bleeding from more than 30 wounds, she had been stabbed by a knife and bludgeoned by a revolver and candlestick. When the police, doctors, and the examining magistrate arrived shortly after, they were horrified to find a murder that struck at the very heart of the French elite. The Choiseul Pralin bore one of the great aristocratic names of France and were close to the royal family. The Duke was a member of the Chamber of Peers and the Duchess the daughter of Horace Sebastiani, a prominent political figure. But far worse for the fate of the regime was the fact that it was immediately obvious that the Duke was the murderer. He claimed that the murderers were robbers, but there were no signs of forced entry, and he had traces of blood on his clothes and signs of struggle on his body. Later, later that day, while under house arrest, but not always closely supervised, he swallowed a vial of arsenic, and he died less than a week later. So the accepted version of the lead up to this murder-suicide is as follows. The marriage was a miserable one, not a surprise. Um, the Duchess was passionately in love with him and devoted to their children, 10 total of whom nine survived. But the Duke did not reciprocate her, her affection. Instead, he was constantly unfaithful to her and was having an affair with Henriette de Luzy, who until recently had been the children's governess. The Duchess had dismissed de Luzy earlier in the summer, upon which de Luzy had reportedly told the Duchess that she will pay a high price for her actions. In this account, the Duke had killed his wife as a form of vengeance, and so that he and de Luzy could marry. And it should be said that this narrative is, while it's largely been accepted, it really bears a very uh, loose relationship to the truth. Notably, de Luzy was neither involved in the murder nor the original source of problems within the household. They predated her tenure as governess. And if she and the Duke were close, there's no evidence that they were lovers. Instead, by 1847, the dissension in the household primarily stemmed from the Duchess's feelings of estrangement from her husband and progeny on the one hand, and the Duke and de Luzy's desire to protect the children from their mother's rages and abuse on the other. So the crime was a private tragedy for the family and a public disaster for the July monarchy. For one, it's a case of elites behaving very, very badly. In a study of scandals, the sociologist Ari Adut describes how elites represent groups, institutions, and values, and thus their individual transgressions are seen as speaking to the behavior of elites more generally. The Duke's actions painted the aristocracy as violent and sexually deranged. Opponents of the regime described his crime as highlighting the sexual decadence of the aristocracy, the inherited madness that was so common due to aristocratic endogamy, or the criminality of elites. None of this put the embattled regime, one that restricted political power to the wealthiest, in a very good light. Moreover, many were furious at the state's delay in arresting the duke, one that allowed him to swallow poison unnoticed in his bathroom. The problem it was that, as a peer, the Constitutional Charter of 1830 
stated that he could only be arrested with permission of the Chamber of Peers, which obviously in August is not in session, right? I mean, you know, if you're an aristocrat, you're not going to be in Paris in August. Um, and at the end of August, the scandal came to encompass issues of freedom of the press. The government brought charges against oppositional newspapers for publishing articles on the affair, for troubling, quote, public peace by exciting the hatred or scorn of citizens, unquote, against the aristocracy, the government, and the king. And indeed, the case is frequently mentioned as a cause of the revolution of 1848, along with a series of other scandals, um, such as the test affair, that convinced many that the July monarchy was rotten to the core. Most of these scandals revolved around financial corruption, but the specter of sex and violence in the choiseau paulin affair made it into the most lurid of these affairs. So while the opposition press used the affair as proof that the ruling class was immoral and violent and therefore incapable of governing, I want to concentrate here on what I find very strange about the affair, which is how the government actually tried to use the scandal to bolster its position. It published many of the documents relating to the murder-suicide, including transcripts of the interrogations of witnesses, and most crucially, the Duchess's letters to her husband. And these became wildly popular um, at the time, and they're published in numerous re-editions, and she became regarded as the sort of latest in the long line of great female letter writers, a sort of mid-19th century Madame de Sévigny. The government published the investigative file in part to prove that they had not shown the Duke excessive leniency, but in the rest of the paper, I want to show how these documents and the letters of the Duchess ones in which she discussed her husband's and children's attitude towards her, served another purpose for the state. In particular, they made an argument that love and hierarchy went hand in hand, and that love was a duty that one owed another in recognition of their position. In turn, love, in its maternal version in particular, was a force that connected rich and poor and bolstered the regime's legitimacy. So this notion that love originated from hierarchy and a respect for the other's status um, in the household or in society should really, I think, challenge us to reconsider how we view questions about the relationship between individualism and egalitarianism on the one hand and sentimentalism and or romanticism on the other. So historians have done a great deal to map the heightened emotional tone of the period from the mid-18th to the mid-19th century describing, for instance, the open displays of sentiment that became more culturally acceptable in the middle of the 18th century, a political culture which employed an emotional language, a more sentimental vision of the family, and literary and intellectual movements which focused on descriptions of emotional states. And at one level, the Duchess's letters played a part in this culture of sentimentalism. Her letters are really nothing but a description of emotional states and they focus on how she felt about the way her husband and her children were treating her. And as will be discussed, these outpourings of emotion were bound up in political struggles and used as a way for the July monarchy to defend itself. But a lot of work on the history of both the emotions and the family has attempted to connect this more effective vision of domestic life to a shift from a hierarchical model of the family to a more individualistic one. And to suggest that this then fed calls for a more egalitarian political and social order. And I think this may be true for many swept up in the tides of emotion around the decades of 1800. I want to show how a more conservative vision of the family, society, and the polity was not irreconcilable with sentimentalism. And in turn, I think this poses questions about how we connect politics and power relations to questions about the emotions. So the Duchess's published letters offer a narrative of the difficulties in the choiseau prelin household, a narrative that's in part constructed by her through writing her letters, and in part by the state. Um, they actually suppress some of her letters, and they rearrange the chronology to paint her in as positive a light as possible, and to sort of pin everything they could on de Luzzi. Um, and so the first letters spoke primarily about the Duchess's relationship with the Duke. Um, they recounted her anguish that he wanted little to do with her, either sexually or emotionally, and expressed his desire for a reconciliation. Towards the end, the Duchess's concerns were much more about her children. She knew her marital relationship was hopeless, 
um, and that she had permanently lost her husband's affection, and she now feared that the same was coming to pass with her children as they attached themselves to Duke and Delusi as a sort of reformed family. She thus accused her husband of raising their children at a distance from and with a contempt for their mother, in her words, and that he had, quote, accustomed them to avoiding their mother, unquote. Alternately, in a letter written from their country home, the Duchess stated that as soon as that she arrived, she saw in your icy, disdainful, and displeased air, in the constrained expression of my children, in the small green eyes that appear behind your shoulder, that I will be subject to humiliating treatments. These letters reveal what is even clearer in the unpublished familiar correspondence that sits in the Archive Nationale, that the children really disliked their mother and indeed had come to fear her. The published interrogations of Deleuze gave one reason for the children's estrangement and indeed animosity towards their mother. And the governess spoke of how the Duchess mistreated or rudoyé um, the children. And actually the examining magistrate, Brousset, seemed to accept this claim. Um, and in response, he asked her if she thought that the Duke killed the Duchess, quote, to defend his children from their mother's poor treatment, unquote. Both the Duchess and the authorities, however, understood the children's lack of love for their mother, not in terms of her behavior, but instead of terms of disrupted domestic and social hierarchies. The problem was that Deleuze had usurped the place of the Duchess in the household in both the Duke's affection and the children's, and in so doing had overturned the natural order of things. So in the first interrogation, Brousset accused Deleuze of failing to have for her, the Duchess, the consideration and the deference that you, sh you should have had and having sought to alienate the affection of her husband and children from her. In the second, he told her that the affection that the children owed their mother was transferred to you and it was your duty to prevent such an occurrence. Here, love was a duty that the choiseau Pralin children owed to their mother. But Deleuze, a class interloper, had disrupted the flow of affection from mother to children. As a governess, she occupies this liminal space between the middle and lower classes, but she had refused to recognize her aristocratic employer's superior status and had failed in her duty to the Duchess in attaching the children to their mother and had come to replace the Duchess in the affections of the Duke and the children. Her disregard of the hierarchical order of things uh, broke the circuits of affection that were supposed to flow from child to mother. The same view of both the nature of love and the specific disruptions that Deleuze had caused are visible in the Duchess's correspondence as well. Again, she saw love as this duty that her children owed to her. In a letter that she writes to God two months before her murder, the Duchess spoke of her children and her desire that they show her affection and asked God to guide their hearts to the truth, to their duties. Likewise, in a letter to the Duke, she writes, I only ask you to allow me to remain what I should naturally be, your wife, your companion, the mother of our children. She, that is to say, Deleuze, pushed you to separate from me, to give her my place near you, near my children, in the household, and you yielded to her. I ask you only to give her the consideration due to a governess in any household, and you found that it was not enough. Here again, we see this issue that the problem in the household is due to the fact that Deleuze replaces the Duchess, in this case, coming to take over her functions as wife, mother, and manager of the household. The Duchess also view, voiced the view um, that this was a violation of proper status hierarchies, as the Duke had afforded Deleuze more consideration than was appropriate for a woman of her station. The Duchess often report, resorted to a language of the natural, stating that the Duke could overturn the hierarchies of nature in elevating Deleuze above the Duchess. Thus, in another letter, she states that he had altered or denaturé um, her, uh, that is to say, Deleuze's duties, her position, and one who shines in second place is eclipsed in the first place. The idea that the Duke and Deleuze had between them corrupted the national hierarchies through elevating the governess's status and separating mother from child is one intimately tied to a conservative worldview. Terrible things, whether that be familial disorder or murder, result when individuals are elevated above their station. 
respect for hierarchies, followed God's plan, and ensured peace. In other words, these documents helped the government make an argument for the maintenance of hierarchy in an atmosphere of revolutionary ferment and calls for democratization. And I want to pursue this line of uh, connecting emotions, a hierarchical vision of society, and the government's defense of itself in 1847 through an examination of some of the ways that the Duchess was publicly discussed after her death. Um, in a speech to the Chamber of Peers, Pequier, the Gaudi so which is like the sort of minister of justice, stated that the Duchess was an angel of goodness and spoke of her as being worthy of her wealth by acts of charity that were constantly inspired by the principles of the holy religion with which she was imbued. Pequier was here making a claim about how charity justified hierarchy and inequality. The statement was also meant to uphold a positive vision of the aristocracy as endlessly giving to the poor, one that served as an alternative to the image of, that the Duke painted of a sexually immoral and criminal elite. Hence, he suggested that the public should concentrate on the Duchess's actions and character instead of the Duke's. And he claimed that despite the most furious frenzies of the most perverse men, providence frequently places the most angelic virtues, seeking to give humanity the right to avert our eyes from the perversities that sadden us. The Duchess, a model of virtue, should be the metonym for the elite, not the immoral duke. Newspapers also held, that the, Duchess, held the Duchess up as a model of benevolence towards the poor. Le Corsa Salin stated that the unhappy duchess was the epitome of charity. The poor from Milan Melun, who all knew the Chateau of Vaux, from which they never returned without an abundant um, alms and consoling word, uh, nicknamed the noble and saintly Chatelaine, Notre Dame de Pralin. In similar terms, l'ami de la religion et du roi said of the duchess that her excellent heart combined a constantly active charity and an inexhaustible benevolence to all the virtues of a mother. Both of these worked to link the Duchess's charitable work to her maternity and emotionality. In the first statement, she was a sort of reincarnation of the maternal figure par excellence, the Virgin Mary, who is united by her own unhappiness to the poor she consoles. In the second, her sterling maternal qualities were placed side by side with her consideration for those outside her household and rose out of the same emotional core, her endlessly loving heart. Even more explicitly, a poem written to mourn her de uh, death described her as a second mother to the poor to whom she ministered. And notably, I think all of these statements tend to stress the personal connection between the Duchess and the recipients of her charity. There's some discussion of her giving money to the church um, to spend on the poor, for example, but descriptions of her charitable work tend to be framed less in terms of institutions um, and much more about sort of one-on-one -on -one interactions. So what work did this loving but unloved wife and mother do for the regime? How, in particular, was she meant to stand in for the aristocracy as a whole? For one, these discussions of her charity described an elite bound to the poor by an ethic of care. The regime hadn't abandoned lower classes, but instead was busy providing for them in a highly personal and emotional fashion. If the Duchess was a maternal figure for the poor, who was a metonym for the upper classes, then this suggested that the regime's elite, or at the very least the female members of the elite, should be treated in the way that mothers were treated. And according to the Duchess's letters and the authorities, mothers slash the upper classes were owed love due to their elevated social status and position as mothers, which could here stand for obedience and respect as well as affection. Mentions of the Duchess's abuse of her children and her temper were thus not merely a break from the image of the Duchess as a perfect wife and mother. And instead, in a really incredibly cynical fashion, they may have served to bolster the regime. Um, whatever the, the argument, right, is whatever the elite sins, their position as the elite did not negate the duty of the regime's dispossessed to love them. In other words, the poor of France should stop agitating for political and social change out of respect for both the position and the maternal affections of aristocratic women. So I want to end with a consideration of what this examination of the literature of the Choiseul-Prelin affair does and does not show.
So to be sure, this vision of love as respect for position was hardly successful in stabilizing the regime. Um, the scandal whipped up much more anger than elites than sympathy. But I do think it should uh, prod us to rethink whether or not we think that the heightened emotionality of the late 18th and early 19th century necessarily went hand in hand with egalitarianism and individualism, given how intense discussions of emotions and claims about the nature of sentiment could align with a hierarchical vision of society. As a more general mythological point, these examples suggest that we should think about whether we want to say that emotional styles necessarily have a force to produce historical change on their own, or whether they merely operate as signs of and or justifications for either pre-existing or emergent power relations.